All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to those who have been able to join us in person today and to everyone who is joining us online uh, for this special medical grand rounds uh, hosted here at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph's Healthcare sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome our speakers who are joining us today all the way from South Africa. We, ha we have today Dr. Quraysha Abdul Karim and Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, uh, who will be speaking with us about tackling epidemics in Africa with science. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, this rounds is being co-hosted by um, our St. Joe's Department of Medicine, the McMaster Department of Medicine, the St. Joe's Research Institute, as well as the Health Evidence and Impact Department at McMaster. And with us today, we have Dr. Lahana Taban, who is going to come up and uh, provide a more formal introduction to our speakers. Welcome, Lahana. All right, thanks, Madeline. And uh, welcome everyone, uh, those online and those who are here in person. All right, I'm delighted that you could join us for this special rounds. And um, I welcome both Croatia and uh, Slim, uh, you know, in Hamilton. Um, we feel absolutely privileged to actually that they left 30 degrees plus to come uh, to sub-zero temperatures uh, to be with us. They're actually friends of McMaster and tomorrow will be uh, the official day when they join the McMaster family, when they receive their honorary degrees for their outstanding contributions in science and how through their relentless pursuit of answers to inform care in both HIV and TB, whether it was prevention, treatment, management, including other infectious diseases, which has been um, their commitment. Born and raised in Durban, South Africa, both Slim and Croatia, are infectious diseases ep epidemiologists whose main research interests are in understanding the evolution of HIV pandemic in South Africa, the factors influencing the acquisition of the HIV infection in adolescent girls, and sustainable strategies to introduce antiretroviral therapy in resource strain settings. SLIM is the director of the Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, CARISA. He is the pro Vice the Pro Chancellor Research at the University of Kasulu, Durban, Adjunct Professor of Immunology and Infectious Disease at Harvard, Adjunct Professor of Medicine at Canal University in New York, and Pro Chancellor Research at the University of Long List, and served as a former president of the South African Medical Research Council. Koresha is a research scientific director, associate research director. Um, Scientific Director at Carissa. She's a Professor of Clinical Epidemiology at Columbia University, Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor for African Health at the University of Kosulu Natal. Both have contributed immensely to global health and have been serving on many WHO panels that really have informed care of people uh, with lots of um, infectious diseases. They have a long list of impressions, uh, impressive um, international awards and honors. And I have to mention that they've also been recently recipients of the Gardner Global Health Award, which was awarded in 2020. And they were here recently uh, to be honored. Despite growing under the most repressive apartheid regime in South Africa, they both were not only uh, did they survive the system, but they actually thrived uh, with laser focused determination to uplift all South Africans uh, to prevent ill health. They are not only brilliant scientists, but they're genuinely humble, kind, and generous people 
who have dedicated their time in mentoring many, many people in Africa. Actually, the people they've mentored, they are counted in not only hundreds, but thousands, if you combine all the work they've done. This morning, I want us to actually uh, listen to just the gist of their journey of how they tackled pandemics in Africa with science. And as you can imagine, this has not been an easy journey, but they have gone through the journey with a lot of integrity and certainly with lots of grace and humility. So please join me in giving them a warm McMaster welcome. Salim, uh, Croatia, whoever wants to start. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline and Lehana, for this uh, really warm um, and generous welcome. And uh, it's really an honor and privilege to be here this morning uh, as part of this special Grand Rounds. And I want to thank all of the organizers uh, who've uh, come together to create this opportunity for us. So uh, what uh, Slim and I will do this morning is talk about several epidemics. And I think while most of us are still very focused on the current pandemic, the current pandemic I think has brought more attention to epidemics, to outbreaks and uh, thinking about better preparedness. It's reminded us of our shared vulnerability and also our interconnectedness. And I think this is also a great opportunity where we can share and exchange um, lessons we're learning in dealing with epidemics and pandemics. And so we're going to talk about AIDS, TB, COVID-19, and generally about um, African science and its contributions and, and our perspectives on what have we learned from these various uh, epidemics and our responses that can help us all be better prepared for the next um, epidemic, uh, hopefully not another pandemic. And I'd like to start with quoting from Plato that excellence is not a gift but a skill that takes practice. Because in everything we do, we have to strive for excellence, for doing the best that we can and serving the populations that we serve with nothing but the best. So um, just a very quick reminder about the AIDS pandemic. And I think in 2016, when UN member states agreed and committed to ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, um, they were very, uh, that very laudable goal uh, also set some important targets. By 2020, we would have 90% of people living with HIV, knowing their status, um, being initiated on treatment, and virally suppressed the 90-90-90 paradigm. And that uh, by 2020, we'd have 500,000 new infections, and we'd have uh, AIDS transformed from a chronic manageable condition to, uh, sorry, from one that was inevitably fatal to chronic and manageable. And, and other modes of transmission would be close to eliminated. Well, here we are, you know, uh, in 2022, and the most recent data we have is from 2021. And globally, there were 38.4 million people living with HIV. We still saw 650,000 deaths. And of greatest concern is the one and a half million new infections, with, which roughly translates to about 4,000 new infections each day as a reminder that we have a long way to go to get back on track for the 2030 goals. And also that in our midst, uh, there are many, many challenges that remain. Uh, Africa remains home to 70% of the global burden of infection. We come from South Africa, has less than 1% of the global population, but is home to one in five infections. But this is a striking and unique characteristic about the epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. So besides it being a generalized epidemic, young women between 15 to 24 years bear the brunt of this epidemic. They have about 25% of all new infections, and, um, and it's a big driving force in terms of uh, sustaining the epidemic um, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, and, and uh, ensure it despite very high background uh, prevalence. And just to give you some indication of this, um, 
a problem and challenge that we have uh, in terms of young women. I share with you some data from a school-based surveillance program uh, that we had in place, or a cross-sectional survey undertaken with kids who are second and third year in high school, in high school being four years. And what you see here is that HIV infection is somewhat rare in uh, men. In contrast, when you look at the data in women, you see already by age 15, about two and a half times more infection in young women. And that steadily doubles and increases, where by age 19, it's all just over one in 10 infections. And then you have this 25% um, in those over 20 years. Now we were able to, in the same community from a population-based survey, uh, identify newly infected individuals and sequence the viruses and come up with a schematic that uh, shows quite um, definitively uh, based on our epidemiological data that goes back from 1990 that shows how these age disparate relationships where young women get infected um, about five to seven years earlier uh, compared to men, uh, how this uh, cycle of transmission uh, is really impacting ongoing new infections and why prevention in, of HIV infection in young women between 15 to 24 years is critical for breaking the cycle of transmission and chains of transmission. Uh, and, and here what we see is young women under the age of 25 are primarily acquiring infection from men who are over 25, and there's about an 8.7 year age difference. And these men in turn are getting infected from women over 25 um, and infecting women uh, over 25. Uh, here, the age difference is 1.1. And because these men over 25 are simultaneously having relationships with women um, under 25 and women over 25, you see this uh, cycle of transmission. These data was uh, is very much part of the UNAIDS um, strategy of getting on the fast track in 2016 and has also impacted and influenced the South African government's national strategic plan, which is about coming to an end and a new one is about to be released. But what's also important to appreciate is that by now you have a good sense of the risk young women face, young women under 25, the importance of breaking chains of transmission or, or these young women remaining uninfected. But when we first described this in 1990, and uh, even today, when we look at what do we have available to prevent HIV infection, all of these options of abstinence, behavior change, medical male circumcision, male condoms, all depend on male cooperation, which is pretty challenging if you're a young woman in a relationship with an older man, when there's a whole lot of gender power dynamics going on. And in fact, in speaking to women from different settings, peri-urban, rural, young, older, et cetera, we were seeing that they understood their risk, but did not have something that they could use to control themselves from remaining uninfected. And so started our journey some uh, 25 years ago in terms of trying to find technologies that women can use uh, to protect them from getting infected. And the blue line here we see is, um, is, is really uh, telling you about this epidemic uh, that was unfolding in, um, in uh, South Africa uh, as we were starting to understand the epidemic and uh, develop responses to it. And you see this very explosive uh, spread of infection in, in the first uh, five years between 1990 to 1995 continuing to grow very rapidly and then stabilizing uh, between about 2004 and 2010. And while this rapid spread was ongoing, we were trying very different ways and many ways uh, to try and find a technology that women can use. And many of what uh, the products that we were evaluating very early on were things that were licensed vaginal contraceptives in the second generation was about altering the charge in the general tract. And it wasn't until 
2002-2003, where um, uh, following the establishment of the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria and the US Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, that we really had the opportunity to provide antiretroviral treatment to the millions of people living with HIV and dying of AIDS in Africa. In that process of providing antiretroviral treatment, and you will hear a little bit from Slim in a few uh, minutes about the most common opportunistic infection uh, that we see with advancing HIV disease was TB. And about 70% of the people with HIV with advancing HIV disease ha have co-infection with TB. And the challenge at that time in providing antiretroviral treatment was finding the drug combination that wasn't antagonistically interacting with the TB treatment and also trying to sort out the timing of TB treatment. But in that process, we started to use a drug called Tenofova. And uh, Tenofova, uh, we found, was a very effective therapeutic agent. It had a good safety profile, was rapidly absorbed with a long half-life. And also we had data that shows it suppresses viral load. And there were some um, non-human primate studies uh, showing a protective benefit. Um, the women that we uh, work with in many communities are partners of migrant laborers, and they don't see their partners every day. They understood their risk was related to sex, and so they were working with us to come up with a strategy that they could use when they're having sex, and we drew here on the HIVNET-012 um, a trial uh, about reducing mother-to-child transmission of HIV, where a dose of nevirapine given to the mother on, at onset of labor and a dose to the infant within 72 hours was of birth, um, a drawing on all of the data we had on Tenofovir, we came up with the BAT24 um, strategy. Um, no sooner had we enrolled the first uh, two participants, we met with criticism from about 29 scientists in Europe and the US saying this trial was doomed uh, to failure. There was a very long global consultation about the ethics and the scientific uh, basis of this trial. Say so we then proceeded um, having, uh, uh, having uh, provided the evidence uh, for the ethical and scientific justification for this trial and its dosing strategy. And 18 years since we started our first trial, trying to find a prevention technology for women, we were able to present this data at the International AIDS Conference, uh, the CAPRISA 04 trial data that showed a 39% uh, overall protective benefit uh, for women who um, had uh, the Tenofova gel uh, in terms of preventing HIV infection. And uh, the data was presented at the International AIDS Conference simultaneously um, um, uh, published in the journal Science. And in that year, it was considered one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs uh, by science and one of the top two breakthroughs by the journal Lancet. Um, so while at this stage we had treatment for AIDS and we had a range of interventions to reduce mother to child transmission globally, the challenge was how do we prevent HIV infection, particularly that uh, sexually transmitted infection. And you know, with P you, one could argue with PMTCT and treatment, you test someone, you know their status, and then no matter where you are in the world, there's a set of things you can do. With prevention, there's a lot more heterogeneity in terms of the risk and understanding the diversity of the populations. A lot more challenging to get to what is the best options and, uh, and, and um, the CAPRISA 04 trial to say at this juncture was uh, really such an important sign of hope in the prevention field that it made the frontline um, news in many of the big journals like um, the uh, newspapers like New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, etc. WHO had a consultative meeting very uh, soon thereafter. But also what followed was a number of trials um, that uh, evaluated 
daily oral formulations of tenofovir with emtacitabine. And I think a lot of you would be familiar with the concept of PrEP. Um, and so oral PrEP um, is now quite widely used, part of policy and programming in, in many parts of the world. And, um, and so the Caprice 4 trial was the first proof of concept of the use of ARVs. And what we've learned over time is that, um, you know, all of these, whether it's oral tablets or whether it's the topical gel um, or whether it's the dipiverine ring or two monthly injections, things need to be used to be effective. And adherence is uh, quite important. And adherence really varies um, uh, in terms of some populations. For example, in San Francisco, uh, high uh, uptake of PrEP has resulted in about 43% reduction in new HIV infections. In Africa, we've had lower uptake um, and uh, adherence in most populations, but for example, in discordant couples, when the a positive partner is being initiated on treatment, for example, during that six months until viral suppression is reached, we've got good uptake and adherence. And now the landscape in terms of PrEP has changed quite substanti substantively. Industry has gotten very involved and we're seeing a whole lot of trials that are underway. So in addition to the most recent results from uh, Vive on uh, two monthly injections of long acting cabotegravir, we have Gilead has trials in the field with a, um, a capsid inhibitor called Lencapavir. Uh, and then we also have Merck uh, testing monthly pills and, uh, and then a whole range of people also evaluating um, implants uh, and so on. All of these are designed to address some of the, the uh, daily adherence challenges, uh, even as PrEP is currently part of uh, prevention practice in most settings. I wanted to spend the last few minutes talking about a slightly different PrEP. So I, we've spoken about ARVs and mainly tenofovir-based um, antiretrovirals. I want to switch now to a biological PrEP. And uh, here in the past uh, 10 years or so, we've identified a few individuals across the world um, who, when they get infected with HIV, don't develop just antibodies. They develop a very special class of antibodies called broadly neutralizing antibodies. And there's a panel of uh, viruses isolated from all over the world that if you um, do these neutralizing assays using that panel, these broadly neutralizing antibodies have various um, amounts of potency to neutralize these uh, viruses. And I wanted to talk about Caprisa 256. Um, Caprisa 256 was uh, one of these uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that was isolated in one of our studies in Caprisa that's an acute infection study where we enroll individuals uh, who are either infected or recently infected and follow them up uh, over time. And in uh, 20, uh, using our biorepository, we were able to find this particular participant, Caprisa 256, and uh, established um, uh, that she makes these antibodies that are very, very uh, potent and that um, we, because we had sequential samples, we were able to describe exactly how and at what time post-infection these antibodies uh, started to emerge and, and uh, how, how uh, they came to be. So the ontogeny of uh, the CAP256, in other words. Uh, working in partnership with the Vaccine Research Center at the U.S. National Institutes of Health, we were able to identify the B cell, that single B cell that produces these antibodies, uh, immortalize uh, these antibodies, and then work with them to make them even better create sufficient quantities so that we could um, evaluate them in monkeys um, using a shift challenge 
what we've seen is all of the monkeys that were not exposed to um, Caprisa 256 antibodies got infected within a short uh, time after challenge, whereas those who were given varying doses of Cap256 antibodies, a type of passive immunity, if you like, remain uninfected. So um, we've worked from there to develop uh, more, um, uh, more of the CAP256. We've done some early first in human studies to establish safety. And uh, we now will be moving towards the um, proof of concept uh, in combination with another antibody called VRC07 to see whether this combination of 256 and VRC07 can, if given to uninfected people at high risk of getting infected, be protected from getting infection. And uh, I think that would then um, open the path for uh, a biological prep uh, of passive immunity and also may give us some clues and guidance in terms of what an HIV vaccine should look like in terms of antigen uh, targets. And uh, that's where I'm going to stop on the HIV and hand over to Slim to continue with the rest. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Croatia. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be with you here today in Hamilton. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our hosts uh, for giving us this opportunity. So you've heard from Croatia about our work on HIV prevention in women. I'm going to talk about our work on tuberculosis and COVID-19. So let's plunge into TB. Back in the early 2000s, we had a major concern in that the main cause of death in South Africa were patients who were co-infected with HIV and TB. And at that time, I remember it was 2002, I took the opportunity to ask various colleagues, how would you treat somebody who had HIV and TB? And I got completely different answers. And the reason was very simple. There wasn't any evidence available. And the reason it, was, it wasn't evidence is that those parts of the world where antiretrovirals were available, TB wasn't a problem. In those parts of the world, in Africa, where TB is the major opportunistic infection, antiretrovirals were not available. So we decided back in 2002 that we would do a study to address this question and establish what's the best way to treat patients who have both TB and HIV, recognizing that it's already the main cause of death in South Africa at the time. And we undertook a clinical trial testing three different approaches to treating patients with TB and HIV and showed that the strategy where we integrated antiretroviral drugs and tuberculosis treatment, that that combination and the way in which we provided it reduced mortality by 56%. And that then uh, uh, was presented to the world and Within a matter of two months, the WHO put out a rapid advice, which they do if they're not waiting for a new guideline because of the benefits to patient care. And uh, uh, shortly thereafter, many countries adopted this overall approach that we had showed in the study. And I'm showing you on the right-hand side, the US CDC guidelines that adopted the approach that we outlined. And in South Africa, it was implemented, and essentially we showed that it was averting about 10,000 deaths per year. So these two uh, papers in the NEJM that we published on the approach to managing patients with HIV and TB, uh, <clears throat> because they were in the rapid advice and then became part of the WHO guidelines, Anybody with TB and HIV anywhere in the world, if they're being treated according to the guidelines, are being treated based on the research that we undertook. In South Africa, the president announced back in 2009, that was about three months after we presented our results, and he announced that uh, uh, 
patients with HIV and TB will be treated according to our strategy and they'll be treated in under one roof. And you can see here how back in 2009 that the annual number of registered TB deaths was 69,251. And within a matter of five years, when we look at 2015, that the number of deaths reduced to 33,603, essentially a 52% decrease in the annual number of TB deaths since our results became available. Now, I'm not um, ascribing it all to our results, but certainly they contributed in some way to saving lives. So let me go to COVID-19. I've shared with you just, you know, I'm not going to go through the details of what we've been doing on tuberculosis, but I thought I'd just share that one study finding, which has been impactful. So let's go to, to COVID-19. So very early on, we were all trying to find out what's the best way to deal with COVID-19. And it was uh, at a very early stage, I think it was around April of 2020, uh, developed the eight stage response that we used in South Africa and uh, described it in the New England Journal of Medicine. Several, several countries have adopted a similar kind of overall strategy to dealing with COVID-19. And one of the things we uh, began studying very early on is following the uh, introduction of the lockdown, we wanted to study what its impact was and how it was changing HIV and TB care. And we published this piece in science where we looked at this problem and showed the dramatic drop in the number of patients who were getting viral loads, who were getting TB, new TB diagnoses. We then did a larger study, which we published in the Lancet, that looked at 69 clinics and we showed the impact on care for HIV and TB. But what was interesting, very few patients stopped taking ARVs. And that's a, the reason for that is South Africa had already developed a community-based strategy for distributing ARVs. Because we have you know, over 5 million people with HIV infection in South Africa, they can't be coming to the hospitals and clinics. It would just swamp the system. So actually, that served as an advantage in that very few patients uh, had difficulty with continuity of treatment. But what they had was the problem that even though the hospitals and clinics were open, they were not coming there because that's where the COVID patients were. And they were not going to go anywhere near the healthcare services at the time. And then, of course, in uh, November of 2020, we discovered the beta variant. In fact, the way in which uh, my colleague Tulio de Rivera, whose laboratory is a floor below mine, is when he uh, found a group of seven patients who had this very unusual virus and came up and discussed it with me. The first thing we did, you know, is phone the minister to tell him, you know, we got this funny virus going on here. We don't know what it means, but the virus has been very stable up to now, and this is a very unusual virus. And we shared it with the WHO. And at the meeting, Andrew Rombold, who is from the UK, said, well, they haven't been seeing this, but maybe they should reanalyze their data. And of course, the next week when they reanalyzed their data, they realized they also had a new variant that had already been spreading and they hadn't picked it up because of the analytic approach. And so they announced uh, a new variant first and we, when we saw that they had already made the announcement, we announced a uh, beta variant uh, two or three days later. But one of the important things was to understand how each new variant was changing what we needed to do. How, how, how does it impact immunity? How does it impact clinical care? How does it impact clinical presentation? And so that's what we were having to study very early on. And it was important we do that because the viruses were spreading in South Africa before the rest of the world. So we needed to share that uh, with the rest of the world. But one of the things that became very clear as we were studying the variants is that our original pandemic strategy was out the window. So here was our original pandemic strategy. You know, we've got a pandemic, we've got an infectious disease. We know we have a challenge in
so we knew we had a, <clears throat> a challenge of an infectious disease. Our strategy was let's slow down <clears throat> infection until we develop a vaccine or a treatment. And while we're doing that, as soon as we have a vaccine, we can then immunize everybody and get back to normal. So that was you know, all of a three line grand plan. But the variants put paid to that because it meant that our vaccines were no longer as efficacious as we had hoped. And so we began to think about that. What is a new end game and how, how do we need to change? How are we thinking about how to end the COVID-19 pandemic? And so we've been trying to grapple with that. And one of the major initiatives was by the International Science Council that looked at scenarios about how we could possibly be moving forward in ending the pandemic. And as we were doing all of this, a new variant emerges. And we announced this in November of last year. And uh, this uh, piece that we published in The Lancet was the first description of the available data we had from all of, I think, one week's worth of information about how Omicron was spreading. And we showed, calculating its doubling time, that it was more than twice as fast as Delta in the rate at which it was increasing. We now know, of course, it's actually a little bit faster than that, but you get some idea of the challenge that we were grappling with with Omicron. And this was before Omicron was spreading anywhere else. So we were literally uh, you know, learning as we went along. But what for us was important was that we had to contribute to diagnostics, vaccines, and treatment. And in the diagnostics, we partnered with the ACT Accelerator, the WHO, and as part of FIND's program, FIND is the partner in the ACT Accelerator developing new diagnostics, we became one of the principal centers responsible for evaluating new diagnostics for COVID-19, which we were doing in our clinics and our laboratories. We also undertook several vaccine studies, but for me, one of the big issues was about the global vaccine inequity. And uh, it was very important that we take a stand and we uh, ensure that we made our voices heard about how unacceptable the vaccine inequity was. And we did so in many different papers, this including this editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what was particularly unconscionable was while we didn't have vaccines in South Africa, that there was a huge amount of wastage of vaccines in many other countries, including Canada, by the way, uh, because Canada was one of the countries that bought excessive amounts of vaccine prior to knowing which vaccines would be effective. So they bought pretty much everybody's vaccines. And this became a big issue around vaccine wastage because vaccines are very short expiration dates and countries couldn't absorb the supply that was being provided. But it became important for us to also participate in uh, developing new treatments for COVID-19. And Croatia served on the WHO Solidarity Trial Executive Committee where they were driving the agenda on repurposed drugs. But for me, the big challenge that I had to deal with in much of Africa was the quacks who were still uh, prescribing drugs like ivermectin and fluvoxamine. I mean, even to this day, if a patient has COVID-19 and goes to a general practitioner, there's a one in three chance they're gonna be prescribed ivermectin and fluvoxamine. And so we published this piece in the New England Journal of Medicine that it's really time to stop using these ineffective COVID-19 drugs. And I, I borrowed from the WHO guidelines, which make it very clear. So if you look at the top uh, row, the WHO provides a recommendation against certain medications, which they don't normally do in a guideline. A guideline is about what you should use, not about what you shouldn't use generally. But because of the challenge in COVID-19, the WHO has a specific recommendation against the use of ivermectin and fluvoxamine. And there is now very clear evidence that uh, for many randomized controlled trials that both drugs provide no benefit. 
But it's not, it's important that it's not just that these drugs are harmless when you use them. It's that patients who are being prescribed ivermectin or fluvoxamine or, or hydroxychloroquine, they are getting drugs that are not beneficial. And importantly, they are not getting drugs that are beneficial. So it's not just a neutral activity that they are getting ineffective drugs. So I hope I've given you a sense of how African science has contributed to three pandemics between Croatia and I covering the HIV pandemic, tuberculosis and COVID-19. I'm now gonna just give you just a sense of how we've impacted on policy and practice across the globe just giving you a quick sense of how African science is feeding into policy across the board. So the first is that in the United Nations, the Secretary General has a 10 member advisory group of scientists who advise uh, Secretary General Guterres on how technology, how science can assist in achieving the world's sustainable development goals. And that 10 member group is co-chaired by Croatia and it's part and parcel of how African research, African science is feeding into global policy making to help the world achieve the sustainable development goals. I serve on the nine member WHO Science Council and serve as science advisor to Director General Tedros. And we have served in various capacities as advisors to UNAIDS. Croatia is the science has until recently been the science advisor to the executive director of UNAIDS. And when the UN high level declaration on ending AIDS was created, we held the sessions and we organized the sessions at the UN uh, that provided the scientific rationale for how we should be thinking about moving towards the end of the AIDS pandemic. And uh, in what you're seeing in front of you is one of those sessions with myself, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Havler, uh, Michelle Sedebe, Croatia, and a few others. But we also feed into policy deliberations in many different countries. In fact, in over two dozen countries right now, this is a briefing I did of the US Congress did a briefing of the UK parliamentary's all-party parliamentary group on coronavirus. So here, just providing new insights that we had on COVID-19, on the variants, on thinking about possible endgame scenarios for COVID-19 and how policy in each of these countries could impact that. One of the most pleasurable things I did was serving on uh, the pontifical uh, Academy of Medicine's uh, meeting where several scientists from across the globe, Francis Collins, Jennifer Durdner, and others came together to produce some uh, approach for the Pope to consider in terms of how uh, the papal see could respond to COVID-19. And very interestingly, you know, among the issues that was raised and became quite important that the Pope took up was his concern about the impact of the crisis on the world's poor and talking about the importance of vaccine equity. And of course, the Pope was a major champion of, uh, of uh, vaccine equity across the globe. So let me end off with what have we learned? So I'm sharing this with you to just give you some idea of the challenges we face, and that even though there's a lot of uncertainty in dealing with COVID-19, there are some things we can predict. So in August of last year, I was asked, uh, you know, what may happen? Is South Africa going to have a fought wave? Are we going to see a new wave of infections? And uh, in one of the interviews that I did with Bloomberg, uh, this particular journalist, Pranisha Naidu, is very persistent. She wanted to know when is the next wave going to occur. <clears throat> so I initially resisted and didn't say what I thought, but it's actually not difficult to calculate when the waves are coming. 
because South Africa has a very systematic set of waves, the interwave uh, interval is pretty uh, consistent at around 94 to 99 days. So I said it's very simple. You just calculate the interwave period, take the end of the third wave, add the interwave period, gives you a second of December. So if we're going to have a fourth wave, it's going to happen on the second of December. Little did I expect that Omicron would come around and South Africa would pass the threshold for the fourth wave due to Omicron on the 2nd of December. So you can imagine that the 3rd of December, there was mayhem in the social media. Professor Karim has manufactured the virus and spread it. That's how he knew that it was going to occur on the 2nd of December. In fact, I was fact-checked by so many different organizations, including Newsweek, that did I really predict that it was going to occur on the 2nd of December when it actually did. But I think we are beginning to understand the complexities of each new wave, of each new variant, what the characteristics are, what the different mutations are driving. And our, we're not in no man's land as we were back when we found the beta variant in November of 2020. We have a better understanding of the rapidity of spread and the infectivity and how this is occurring. We have a better understanding about immune escape. We have a better grasp on what that immune escape means. And as we've looked at Omicron, uh, variations on Omicron, we've seen how individual mutations on Omicron are making such a huge impact on immune escape. So we're getting a better and better understanding of what's uh, going on at this point. But we have to expect that you know this too shall pass, like most other things, that the virus can't keep mutating. It's going to reach a point uh, that it'll keep mutating, but it won't keep mutating to advantage, that it has to get to a point where it can't mutate to advantage anymore. And when it does that, it will get to a variant that remains pretty stable, and it'll just continue mutating at a low rate. When that occurs, then we'll move to endemicity. But then we have to be ready for the next pandemic. And if you just, I thought I would just share with you these data that come from Russia. Now they had described Costa one some time ago, and that was a big concern. And this was from a bat in Russia. And uh, now they've described Costa two, which is uh, a bat coronavirus that can evade pretty much all of the immunity we have from SARS-CoV-2. So this is now potentially the next uh, coronavirus pandemic, just to give you an idea if it does spread into humans. And it has the ACE2 receptor attachment. So the spike protein can attach to the ACE2 receptor. So you can see the challenge we're grappling with that even when we're done with COVID-19, we have to be ready to deal with yet more pandemics. So let me end off with what for me is the key lesson that we have learned from HIV for COVID-19. And having, you know, between Croatia and I, we've, been, we've spent the last 33 years studying HIV. And in those 33 years, one of the most important lessons we've learned is about mutual interdependence. That in HIV, our fundamental approach to transforming what was a global serious pandemic to the current situation where we treat it as yet an, just another infectious disease was all about mutual interdependence and shared responsibility. That once we had the antivirals, that people in Canada, the taxpayer in Canada is putting money into the global fund and the global fund is buying antiretrovirals for poor countries in Africa so that even the most remote village in Africa is able to access antiretroviral treatment and that this is no longer a death sentence. That kind of global solidarity, that kind of appreciation that we are all bound by this virus and that we have to do whatever it takes to uh, deal with it, not because it affects us, but because it affects the whole world. That kind of shared responsibility is critical. 
if we are going to defeat this coronavirus and the ones to follow, we have to understand and appreciate that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing all of the outstanding work you've been doing throughout your careers um, in addressing these infectious diseases, uh, both, both viral and otherwise. Um, I'm going to, just for those who are joining us online, uh, invite you if you have any questions to enter them now into the Q&A. Um, for anyone uh, who's here with us live, if you have any questions, please just raise your ha hand and I'll be happy to uh, repeat the question for our uh, participants online. Uh, we've got one question from the audience. Thank you. global response being shut down South Africa and Southern Africa rather than embracing that you know there was a global challenge to meet the threat of the virus that was months and months and months before this and so you know I think a lot of us have um, hope that that you know the current pandemic can sort of put us in a, in a position where global collaboration is so important and you know the, the, the concept of that, that connecting is incredibly important. But how do you take something like that? I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to come to the microphone and maybe just recap the question sure. for those who are online. And that, that's Dr. Zane Chagla, who was asking the question, one of our infectious disease doctors here. So Dr. Chagla was asking about the challenge we faced that when we announced that we had discovered Omicron, uh, that very evening, the UK imposed uh, travel bans on South Africa. And within three days, Canada had imposed travel bans, Singapore, the US. And what was interesting is that most of them took their lead from the US, actually with the UK and the US, that the travel bans were imposed on uh, eight countries in Southern Africa, six of which had never reported Omicron. So it was, and at that time, there was already a report of Omicron from Hong Kong. So there was no travel ban against Hong Kong. There was a travel ban against these eight countries in Southern Africa, two of which, Botswana and South Africa, had already reported Omicron. So just, just to give you context about what the bans involved. And it was very disappointing because it now tells the rest of the world that if you have a new variant, don't tell anyone about it. It's obvious when you look at the data now, if you analyze GISAID, that within a week of our announcement, 16 countries had already reported Omicron. It didn't occur in those days. It had already spread. By the time we discovered it, it had already been spreading for weeks, probably months even in South Africa to gain momentum. So that we are so interconnected means that we're gonna to have to rethink how we deal with new announcements of infectious diseases. And that travel bans, I don't want to throw them out entirely. They have a very small and defined role and they need to be very carefully used if they're gonna be used at all. And what you don't want is you don't want it to be seen as a punishment because you will basically then be providing a disincentive. Because I can tell you, if we discover pi, we're going to think twice <laughs> about announcing it. Actually, it's not true. I mean, we would, we would do exactly what we did the last time. We would not hesitate. But what the travel bans did, which was really damaging, is that they broke supply chains. 
and the supply chains then became a big problem for us because now we couldn't get reagents. And, and both Tulio's lab and my lab, we started running out of reagents and that became a big challenge for us. So ultimately there was a, a special uh, arrangement made for us to get supplies. But it just gives you some idea that it's not just about what's going on uh, in terms of the host countries, but the impact on the country that actually made the discovery and made the announcement. So I hope it has been a lesson for the whole world. And the WHO took a very strong stand against the travel bans. And I hope that we'll never do that again. And, and should it ever come to pass, I'm hoping that all of you will be standing up and ensuring that Canada does the right thing and not repeat the mistakes it made in imposing a travel ban in November last year on us for announcing Omicron. Thank you, and thank you for that question. Um, another question from the audience. Okay. So Let's I'll just, the question yeah, question. so, so the, the question was, um, given the work that we've been doing on monoclonal antibodies and broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies against HIV, are monoclonals making a comeback? Especially when you look at COVID, there are so many monoclonals that we've been using. I mean, EvoShield is a good example of that. Uh, in certain infections, monoclonals have a very specific role to play, and it's not necessarily a generalizable uh, concept. And I want to just deal with that before I answer your question directly. In HIV, we haven't been able to make a vaccine because we can't get the vaccine to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. And the reason we can't get a vaccine to make broadly neutralizing antibodies Broadly neutralizing antibodies are not created de novo. To get for a human to make a broadly neutralizing antibody, which is rare, there has to be a virus that stimulates the correct germline. The correct B cells have to be stimulated. And then the virus, and then the antibody has to go through a maturation process. So it takes a year, two, three years before an antibody stimulated by a virus becomes a broadly neutralizing antibody. So we've been trying to mimic that in animals by giving a series of four different viruses. We're basically trying to recreate CAP256 in animals, but it's not an easy road. And that's one of the reasons we don't have an HIV vaccine. So in HIV, broadly neutralizing antibodies make a lot of sense because now you can't get the humans to make it through antigenic uh, stimulation. So you can actually give the antibody in those instances. But for most other infections, the body can make these antibodies pretty easily. And COVID-19 is one of those examples. And you really wanna provide antibodies in instances where the body will not be able to make it, immunocompromised states or people are malnourished and so on. The main interest in, in MABS is because cancer research has driven a whole agenda on monoclonals that is driving the cost down. So monoclonals have traditionally been very expensive because it's a tissue culture process. And now we can make monoclonals at a fraction of the price we could before. So I'm anticipating that we will see further 
improvements in the process of making monoclonals and we'll see the price coming down and we're gonna see it becoming even more widespread than it is right now. And in HIV, it has a particular role, but in certain other diseases, it will also have that kind of role. Thank you. Thank you for that response and for that excellent question. Um, that, that brings us up to the end of our time. Uh, and I suspect that little group of folks heading out were folks who needed to be on the clinical teaching unit looking after patients at a certain time. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just again, uh, thank you both. Salim Karisha, uh, Abdul Karim, thank you so much for joining us, uh, for making this journey. And I know you've got many other commitments here in town uh, while you're here. So making the time to join us here at St. Joe's today is much appreciated. And uh, for everyone who joined us in person and online, uh, to Dr. Thaban for helping to bring our speakers here uh, and to Kathy for organizing everything. Thank you. <laughs>